Big story tonight is Dr. Tatu Kamau's case in Machakos High Court seeking to legalize female genital mutilation. She calls it female circumcision. Now, one of Dr. Tatu's outstanding defenses is that FGM should be done medically if legalized. Listen to her explain. Once the act is removed, we'll be able to do it in the best possible way, which is uh, one of the ways being medicalization. And once I've made that decision as a woman, I should be able to access the best medical care that I, I can get to have it done. And our medical correspondent, Dr. Mercy Career, now speaks on this issue that threatens to drive a wedge amongst the doctors and their perspectives on FGM. I will illustrate the medical risks of female genital mutilation through a Somali poem which they called the three female souls, and that's circumcision, the wedding night, and during childbirth. And during circumcision, one of the major risks that women face while undergoing female genital mutilation is bleeding, and women have been known to actually bleed to death. The second risk is that of infections. And during this time, the tools that are used to circumcise these women are crude uh, knives, broken glass, razor blades, and mark you, some of these tools are shared from one girl to the other one. And this can pass infections from one to the other during this circumcision. And actually, women have been known to get these infections and they have died from these infections. Some of the practices include tying uh, the women up after circumcision so, so that they do not bleed. And once they do this, women are immobile, they get scar tissue in their female anatomy, and they are not even able to pass urine after that uh, circumcision. And when they get to pass urine, it's really uh, a painful time for these women. Now, during the wedding night, which is the second female sorrow, is that at this time, women experience really painful sexual intercourse because of the anatomy that has changed during circumcision. It has formed scar tissue, and this makes any attempt at sexual intercourse really a painful experience for these women. And those that manage and get pregnant, the third sorrow is during childbirth, where childbearing becomes really difficult. Women have been known to experience prolonged labor. Women have been known to have obstructed labor. And as a result, children have died, women have died during this, uh, during this period. And remember, in some of these communities, women are not really allowed to deliver in hospitals. It's sort of a taboo. And for them, they have to deliver at home, so as a sign of womanhood. And during this time, that's when the complications arise uh, during childbirth, and women actually have been known to die. And of note is that in some of these communities that practice uh, female genital mutilation, Women, have, they have the highest uh, number of uh, maternal mortality rates because uh, of these uh, cultural practices and these taboos that, these cultural practices and this uh, having to deliver at home and making childbirth really a difficult experience and women have actually been known to die from this. The petition uh, seeking for legalization of the female genital mutilation uh, would be interesting one to note. And this being filed by a doctor is really uh, the paradox in it, because after all this risk that we've listed, all this uh, risk to the woman, to the unborn child, and to communities that female genital mutilation causes. It should be interesting to actually know or see where the courts rule. We know there are very many resolutions, some by the UN General Assembly, actually recognizing um, female genital mutilation as a discrimination against the girl child. Resolutions have identified uh, female genital mutilation as causing irreparable damage to the woman. And this is not just the physical damage to the, to the female anatomy, but also the psychological trauma that these women have had to undergo throughout their lives. Some of these women, when they undergo FGM early on in life, they are married off and they never get to go to school. Women actually don't get to reach their own potential. So bearing in mind all these resolutions, all these laws that have outlawed FGM, I think the court should uphold uh, the laws so that FGM continues being outlawed and the world continues fighting or fighting to outlaw FGM in all the countries that is being uh, is, that is that FGM is still being practiced and so that uh, many uh, communities stop practicing FGM because of the trauma trauma 
to the girl, both physical and emotional. And also that we know that girls do not get to reach their potential once they are circumcised, because now they get married off early and they undergo all the other processes that we have highlighted before, like early pregnancies and difficult childbirth. And we have really lost women due to female genital mutilation. Back to you, Yvonne. Thank you, Dr. Masi Career, highlighting the health effects of FGM. Back to our discussion with Masi Chege and Charles Leshore. Masi, um, just talk to us about some of the milestones that have been achieved since uh, this was outlawed and uh, what this case could potentially do to a lot that has been achieved in the fight against FGM. Um, thank you, Yvonne. Um, I think we have come a long way uh, for the last seven years since the law was enacted because we have witnessed where Plan International and AMREF have been working. We can say that we have witnessed very many girls being able to continue with school. And we have also seen a lot of changes in the attitude in the, of the communities. Sometimes uh, the reasons behind FGM are just out of ignorance. When you go to a parent and you tell them, Instead of getting dowry today and tomorrow, you don't have those cows, you don't have that money, let this girl go to school. And very many years, she'll be able to support you because she will have a career, she will have employable skills, she'll have a stable family, she'll live a healthy life, and she'll be able to support you until you're old enough. But if you get dowry, those cows will be gone with the draw, the money will be gone with a lot of festivities here and there. And, and the parents understand. And even if sometimes you have had to rescue girls, because actually we rescue them. It is always the intention of the NGOs, Plan International, AMREF, that these girls can go back home. So we, we have come a long way with the girls. Many girls have been able to go back to school. And there's one, uh, one big success that I can also mention. There are some Maasai elders that we are working with in Kajiado. And they have actually allowed married girls to go and get vocational training so that they can be able to contribute to the household economy, which really is a milestone. Their husbands have allowed them. We have actually put them in a boarding facility for three months where they can get employable skills. And then after that, they will take them for internship. Then they'll go back to their families and they can start the hairdressing, they can start the tailoring, and they also contribute to the household economy. That is how far we have come. We've seen uh, very many communities coming out to say we want our children to be able to continue with school. And we, and we all know that there is nothing much we can give our children these days. Education is the only good investment we can make in, uh, make in our children because one day they'll be able to support themselves. So more girls have been able to access schools. They are living healthy lives. There's a lot of understanding in the family. There's a lot of reconciliation that have got, has gone on in these families. And there are very many people who are supporting uh, the, the fight against FGM. If this suit would go through and uh, we go back and start talking about now girls can go through FGM, we shall break the hearts of so many girls that as civil societies and as the anti-FGM board and the government, we have made promises to these girls. We shall protect your right to access to education, your right to access to survival and development, your right to non-discrimination, all that is gone. And what will those girls say? What will those young women say that you promise something that you could not deliver? All right. I, think, I think at the end of the day, uh -huh. let's think about the girl child. Okay, all right. Uh, we will also hear from her in just a moment. But uh, joining us on phone, and I'll come to you, Lashore, but let's, uh, we will speak to Dr. Abdullahi Adan in just a moment. Uh, Lashore, for you, you've, you've seen some horrific stories, and uh, you've been in some horrific situations uh, regarding FB, FGM. Could you tell us one, you know, really quickly, and, and, and what interventions you were able to make? Well, um, um out there, um, FGM is really a life-threatening situation. And as uh, nurses, uh, the nurses do a good work by making sure that they save some of these cars. One of the, from my experience, one of the experience I had as working as a nurse in Entasopia, Magadi, is of course a woman who, of course, had uh, gone through FGM. She also had uh, what we call cephalopelvic disproportion. Because she was young and she was married at a very early age, a pelvic bone was not developed to be able to deliver. And um, I was able, she has been coming to the clinic, and I really I was able to tell her that she needs to go to Magadi Hospital and get surgery. 
you know, cesarean section. So we, I managed to convince her the first time, the second time, and the third time, the traditional birth attendants who are circumcisers, just told her, who is your mungu? Let us do it here. We have been, we have been helping you here. And uh, it was a very, very sad uh, experience for me because the baby has come out through the head and it got stuck. You know, it couldn't come out. And we really had to rush this lady to, to Magadi uh -huh. and save her life. Actually, they did what we call craniotomy. Just breaking that skull so that the baby can come out and save this mother. Okay. These are things that happen in reality outside there. And uh, they need to protect that. Women go through a lot and, and, um, and, and, and really yeah. uphold their, their right. rights to health and okay. sexual reproductive health. Okay. I mean, so you've, you've seen uh, some pretty uh, interesting things out there as a result of uh, FGM. But let's listen to Dr. Tatu Kamau one more time. She's also convinced that, uh, you know, there is equality in legalizing the cut and that adult women should, in fact, be allowed to make a choice. Listen to her argument. Much as it is done in the girl child, there are many women who have been jailed last, in the last three years, I have noticed. Through the media, print and electronic, many women are making the decision later on in life and they are being harassed and jailed. Once you reach adulthood, there should be no reason why you, you can't make the decision now. Okay, so she's making that a human rights issue. I will speak to Mercy Chege in just a moment. But first, I promised you uh, that we would get Dr. Abdullahi Adin, who's a reconstructive surgeon and has worked with women who've undergone the cut. Dr. Tari, thank you very much for speaking with us on The Big Story tonight. What are your thoughts as far as medicalizing FGM? All right, thank you for having me on, online. Uh, I got caught up. I, I wish I had, I was there. But basically, how do you add the two words, medicalizing FGM? The two do not go together. Because FGM is essentially a female uh, genital mutilation, and uh, medicalizing is essentially another thing. Uh, we, 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 the two don't go together. So I wouldn't really understand medicalizing FGM. Maybe... Legalizing FGM it could be, but even that, they contradict each other. All right. What of uh, the argument that the reason that FGM has such um, serious effects on a woman's health is that it is being done out in the bush using crude weapons, um, perhaps making the argument that it is similar to um, circumcision for men, but that happens out in the bush and not in a safe space using sterilized equipment and being done properly by a professional. What is your take on it being done professionally um, with persons that know what they're doing in the right sort of uh, sanitized environment with the right equipment? Yeah, but uh, it's, you're giving an analogy to uh, legalizing abortion. I mean, we've got a lot of backseat abortions which are happening daily, and uh, a lot of people die. And uh, the, the counter to that argument would be, why don't you sort of legalize abortion? I get whoever is proposing that idea. I get where they're coming from. But uh, I have the gut feeling. I don't have the data. And uh, it would be nice for the opponent of of. of, of, of of, of abortion uh, FGM to come up with data. Whenever you invite a guest, I, I always like to listen to the data. As long as you don't have a data, uh, this clearly, anecdotally and also scientifically, uh, is a very bad thing. And if you say we medicalize FGM, I think there'll be an explosion, an, uh, a substantial, significant explosion of this barbaric act that will uh, spread across our land and beyond. And uh, my opinion... Uh, from my experience, from what I've heard from probably over 200 ladies we've operated, this is the most, the single most indignified, the most horrible thing that can happen to a woman. Okay. And it should never be, uh, nobody should entertain the idea of trying to legalize in an attempt to, 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 yeah. to sort of uh, reduce the, the incidence. All right. There are okay. many other ways. I mean, there's, the war on FGM is going on, and uh, All right. uh, it has bad a lot of fruit. If you look at Masaini, uh -huh. if you look at uh, Eldoret, those areas. Okay. And Dektari? even our own FGM board, guys, are really trying. And uh, my opinion is... All right, Dektari? You can't. It's just going to be impossible. 
All right. Thank you, Dr. Tari. I wish we had more time with you, but we really thank you for your insights. Dr. Abdullahi Aden, he's a reconstructive surgeon, has worked on over 200 women to... Um, who have undergone the cut, calling it the single most indignifying thing that can happen to a woman. Mercy, I need to give you the last word. Is This is a human rights issue. As uh, Dr. Tatu Kamau is saying, please, briefly, in less than a minute, um, please underscore your final point. Um, I think, yes, FGM is a human rights issue. It is a violation of human rights. And I think we should, we, should not, uh, we should not take it very lightly that we are actually wanting to legalize violation of human rights. I think it is so wrong. Even when you're 20 years old and you're being pressurized to make a decision that is against your right, it does not make it right that you're the one who is requesting for it. Even when we say that we will do it in a less painful way, there is no way you can come and tell me, I'm going to kill you, but it's not going to be painful. I'll make sure that I do it very well. That is exactly what she is telling us, that we can kill the dreams of millions of girls that have been given a lifeline by this right. bill. Uh -huh. And uh, we, we want to assume that it's okay. It is okay. not. All right. Thank you. Mercy Chege from Plan International. Lashore, 30 seconds, final comments. Um, I think for me, legalizing FGM is illegal. It's unethical. And I want Kenyans to hear to this statement that we had campaigns to say elephants should stay with their tasks. Let the anti-FGM law stay with the girls and, and the board stay to implement okay. the act. Thank you very much. Charles Lepantis Lashore, who's a cultural nurse, Masai elder, works with communities in championing um, the abolition. And of course, uh, that remains outlawed at the moment. FGM, Mercy Chege, who's the program director, Plan International. Dr. Abdullahi Aden, Lina Jabi, Kilimo, we thank you all for your time on the show tonight, February 26th. We will get to know what happens from there on and all the others that have been enjoined in that case. Thanks for watching The Big Story tonight. I'm Yvonne Okwara Matole, Katie and Prime. Up next with Ben Kitili. Good night. <laughs>